Welcome back, everyone, to Guilty Minds, a virtual conference on mens rea and criminal justice reform. We're now ready to begin the third and final panel of the day, which is titled Willful Blindness and Ignorance of Wrongdoing, Theory, Doctrine, Reform. Moderating this panel is Professor Gideon Yaffe. Professor Yaffe is the Wesley Newcomb Hofeld Professor of Jurisprudence, Professor of Philosophy, and Professor of Psychology at Yale Law School. Professor Yaffe, I'm now going to hand it off to you. Great. Um, so thanks. Um, so I should say, I, if, if I'm reading this right, I, I, the job of being the moderator of the final panel of the conference has fallen to me. Uh, and I think, so uh, before I introduce the panelists, I should just say, um, since there might not be another opportunity for anyone to say this, really, I, I think we should just all thank uh, ASU, the Sandra Day O'Connor Law School, and, um, and especially Michael Sirota, who worked tirelessly for a very long time to produce this extremely impressive conference. And um, I don't know, I, I, I think that we're probably, I'm probably not alone in being very grateful to him for all the work that he did and for this terrific work. So yes, um, applauding. That's definitely of all the things that Zoom is good at, applauding is one of the, one of the least good things on Zoom. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, so our panel, uh, we have, two papers and two extraordinary commentators. Uh, so the two papers are by Doug Husak, who is the distinguished professor, is a distinguished professor at Rutgers um, in the philosophy department. And his paper is titled Ignorance of Wrongdoing in Mens Rea. And Ken Simons, who's a chancellor professor at UC Irvine, and his paper is called Willful Blindness Doctrine, Justifiable in Principle, Problematic in Practice. And then we have two commentators um, Vikrant Reddy, who's a senior fellow at the Charles Koch Institute, um, specializing in justice reform, and Sean O'Toole, who is the founder and president of the Due Process Institute. So um, I should say, from my point of view, one of the really exciting things about this panel is that it's not that frequently that uh, theorists um, like myself, but also like Doug and Ken, get an opportunity to engage in this practical way with people who are advocating in various ways for criminal justice reform. So. Um, so I'm very excited to see what emerges out of this discussion. Um, so I, I was a little uncertain about which paper I should first comment on. Um, I think that the two are connected, but the connections, they're connected by the broad issue of what knowledge requirements should be in criminal law, um, broadly speaking. And, um, but I think the, the issues that they raise are in significant ways separable. And so I thought perhaps I'll just start with Doug's and, um, Make a comment about that, about and then a comment about Ken's paper. Give them a chance to reply, and then give, and then move to the commentators. Um, uh, so Doug's paper. So, um, so Doug is an advocate for a thesis that is a, a provocative thesis, um, maybe even a notoriously provocative thesis that uh, that guilty knowledge, broadly speaking is a necessary condition for full criminal culpability. That you, in order to be fully criminally culpable, you need to know that, you're, that what you're doing isn't allowed, um, whether morally or legally. You have to understand yourself to be engaged in wrongdoing. And uh, in, so he takes that claim about criminal culpability as his starting point in this paper. And the paper then uh, advocates for a particular substantive policy proposal. Um, namely that mens rea of some variety with respect to the wrongfulness of one's act should be included by default. It should be among the things that need to be proven against the defendant in order for the defendant to be held fully criminally liable. Um, and I should note that, so the Mens Rea Reform Act, which many of us followed closely um, in its, before it, you know, it died, which was on discussion, um, which was in discussion yesterday in various panels, um, that this was part of that act in, in all of the drafts that I saw anyway. This was one of the things that was being sought, was a default rule that by default there should be mens rea with respect to wrongfulness as part of each, each offense in federal law. Um, and uh, so now Doug is, so two points. So first, so Doug's, Doug is, it, to see the force of Doug's point, I think it's important to see that as Doug says, he does not care about why a person believes themselves to be acting in a way that they're allowed to act. He cares only that they do 
has a reason to, um, to ameliorate or mitigate their criminal responsibility. So for instance, um, if, you, if you believe that you're allowed to kill your neighbor, Doug thinks, and you do kill your neighbor, Doug thinks you are significantly reduced in criminal culpability, period, quite independently of why it is you believe you're allowed to kill your neighbor. So we can all think of cases in which the fact that you believe that should count in your favor. So if you believe that because you reasonably believe that if you don't kill your neighbor, your neighbor will kill you, for instance, it looks like that looks like a good ground on which to think that you're reduced in criminal culpability. But Doug thinks we don't need a little story like that to tell in order to see that this person has been reduced in culpability. Um, this is, so from that point of view, this is a somewhat radical thesis. Now, one very important part of Doug's positive proposal is that this is default rule. It's, this is by default, he thinks, we should have to be able, to, we should have to prove guilty knowledge against the defendant. And so he's allowing for the possibility that there are exceptions, that there are cases in which you shouldn't have to prove that against the defendant in order to establish full criminal culpability. And so one question that I had was, what kinds of things should override the default? And so for instance, um, it seems to me that one set of conditions that should probably override the default are when there's good reason to think that the defendant believes that they're allowed to do this thing because they have an extremely problematic, even twisted set of values that the state would in no way want to credit or ratify. So if, you're, if your neighbor thinks that he's allowed to kill you, why? Because he thinks that there's a natural, arist a natural arist aristocratic relationship between his, his uh, caste and yours, that you are lesser than him and that therefore you are his object to be used as he pleases, then that's his view and that's why he thinks he's allowed. Then it doesn't really seem, just as an intuitive matter to me, that we should be having to prove guilty knowledge in order to criminally, in order to establish full criminal culpability. So that would maybe be an instance of a default that, that where the, an instance where the default should not apply, an instance where we might want to withdraw this kind of criterion. And so, so then the question is, how should we understand that if, if Doug agrees with that, what would be the best way to implement it? Um, so you might think, for instance, that anybody who believes that they're engaged in acceptable behavior when in fact it's not acceptable, that a kind of that maybe we should be presuming that they have bad values and that that's the reason why they have this belief, as opposed to the presumption going the other direction. And if that's what you think, if you think that it, you can reason from the fact that they made this false inference, this false, they have this false belief about the, about the um, acceptability of their behavior, we can reason from that to the conclusion that they have bad values. And if we think that in when they do have bad values, we shouldn't be applying the default rule, then it seems like many, many instances are going to fall under the default. That is, so many are going to fall under the default that it starts suggesting to me that the proper response would be the other direction, to deny the default rule rather than accept it. Um, so this is a kind of question that I had for Doug. If it's a default rule, what overrides the default? And how can you be confident that the exceptions won't swallow the rule, basically? Um, now, I, I wanted to ask another question. This is um, of Doug, and this is related on the default point. And it's, it's, pointed, it's, it's connected to a point that Steve Garvey made in, a con, um, in yesterday. So Steve pointed out that one way of thinking about mens rea is there should be just as many mens rea elements with respect, just as many mens rea elements concerning elements of the actus reus as are required to establish guilty knowledge. So that we need to show that you knew, so if, if, if you think, well, I knew it was, I knew it was taking the object and I also knew it wasn't mine. Those two facts together would seem to permit an inference that you knew that what you were doing wasn't allowed. Or perhaps they would, or maybe if not, then maybe we add a little bit more. So the question is again, if that's true, if that all that's required, if what we want from mens rea with respect to the elements of the offense is that she, they should permit inferences to guilty knowledge, then maybe then, to ask to require a second additional element placed on the prosecution of having to prove guilty knowledge is to double up the prosecution's burdens unnecessarily. Um, so in which case, if that's in fact, if, if that's in fact the default way in which you're going to prove guilty knowledge by showing mens rea with respect to the elements, why do we need an additional mental state re element requirement on the prosecution? Um, 
So, okay. Um, one question I also want to ask, and I don't know that Doug's necessarily going to be able to answer it immediately in reply, but I, th I think it's a natural thing to come up, is, is whether he, as a way of connecting P Doug's paper with Ken's, is whether Doug believes that willful blindness with respect to wrongfulness should suffice for knowledge with respect to wrongfulness, for to respect to a showing of, wrongful, of knowledge with respect to wrongfulness. Um, I think that the issues there are very touchy and I'd be interested to hear what actually all members of the panel think about that. Um, okay, let me move quickly to, uh, to say a word about Ken's paper. So, um, so Ken's concerned with this very fascinating set of doctrines about willful blindness that are really, they're catnip to theorists <laughs> like, like us. Um, they, they admit of so much kind of conceptual complexity. Um, it feels like a maze that one should surely be able to find one's way out of. And in this paper, he, however, his, his major contribution in the paper is to, put, is to push on a variety of ways in which the doctrine is actually used in practice. A variety of ways in which prosecution seeks to take a shortcut to the proof of knowledge by proving instead willful blindness, where this is understood in the way in which it is in, an, in federal law as involving two conditions, basically, awareness of high probability and some kind of deliberate steps to keep oneself in the dark. And um, so Ken represents the project as one of separate, put, putting aside in a way the theoretical story as to why willful blindness should be allowed if it should be, about which many, many theorists disagree, in, in, service of the, in service of the practical question about how it should be implemented. And I just wanted to, I, I'm interested to hear his reaction to the following kind of concern. I, I wonder the degree to which theory and practice can be pulled apart in our thinking about reform, um, how cleanly they can be pulled apart, if at all. So to give you this one example, um, so willful blindness doctrine requires awareness of high probability under federal law. Uh, so I personally, I mean, as Ken knows, I have a view about willful blindness under which that shouldn't be required. A view of, of willful blindness under which a, a badly motivated agent, an agent who's badly motivated in their decision not to inquire about a fact, about, for instance, whether there are drugs in their trunk, um, should be treated as if they're a knowing agent, even if, in fact, at the time of the, at the time that they cross the border with the drugs, for instance, they're aware of tiny probabilities or even zero probabilities. If they've taken steps for the wrong kinds of reasons to keep themselves in the dark, I have, I think, a principled argument for thinking that they're nonetheless as culpable as a knowing agent. So I would, so, so Ken, Ken in his paper says, hey, look, we don't get any guidance. Judges don't know what, what high probability means. They, you know, does that mean more likely than not? Does that mean 75%? Does that mean high enough to warrant a recklessness charge? What does it mean? And he's right. It's, there's a no precision about this. And it's vague, and one could really fear that that's going to result in in problematic application of the law. But there's a there's a kind of pro so so as a reformer, do you want to push for that? Do you want to push for precision on that point? Well, I would say no, because I would back up to the theoretical thing point and say we shouldn't be having high probability as a as a criterion for willful blindness. Awareness of high probability is a criterion to begin with, and so it seems to me that. So that the reformer's project here has to be intertwined with the theory that tells you that there's equal culpability between the willfully blind and the knowing actor um, in order for you to really make progress on what reform should be. Um, let me raise a couple of other issues. Um, so Ken at the end of his paper and provocatively and interestingly re references empirical studies with which he's been involved and um, Francis Shen, who I hope is on this call, uh, has been a kind of very important pioneer in, of giving ordinary people mens rea categories and asking them to apply them, um, asking them, you, you know, what, applying this mens rea concept to this set of facts. What do you find? Do you think this person is reckless? Do you think this person is knowing? Do you think this person should be punished more heavily than this person in light of their mental states? And um, Ken, in the end of his paper, makes a plea for this kind of research to be done with respect to willful blindness. And I guess I, my question really for Ken was, do you think there's either something special about willful blindness, which requires this kind of empirical inquiry, in contrast to other mens rea concepts? And also, do you think that this kind of empirical inquiry is particularly important when it comes to mens rea, 
in, con in contrast to other elements of, of offenses. So we could ask the same kind of question about, I mean, the obvious one is consent or in the absence of consent, what ordinary people take the boundaries of that concept to be might seem to bear at least on what we think the effect of our jury instructions is going to be. Um, so is it, but that's an actus reus element. So is it in general that you think that there is something about this kind of work which is useful period or something that's especially useful for mens rea or something especially useful for willful blindness? Um, uh, a general question which I can tell you I'm gonna have for the whole panel and which I hope you'll have a chance to talk about is what the limits on willful blindness doctrine ought to be. Um, should it be allowed for corporate defendants where corporate mens rea is itself a very peculiar notion? Um, should it be allowed to establish complicity? Uh, Kim Frizan yesterday said no. I, she's probably right, but why? Um, should it be allowed to establish uh, guilty knowledge? This was the question that I posed to, uh, to, to Doug at the end of those remarks. But, but let me stop there, um, give each of you a chance to reply. Maybe we can start with Doug and then move to Ken, and then I will call on the panel. So I'm first, Gideon. Yeah, okay, thanks so much. Always tough questions. Uh, I am inclined to say something on willful blindness first, although obviously that's Ken's field. We've all, many of us have written about this, I'm inclined to think that willful blindness, a pretty good case for making willful blindness equivalent in culpability to knowledge when there's a particular motivation for being willfully blind. So we need to distinguish different conceptions of what willful blindness is. If in fact, the defendant contrives to do something that he wants to do, that he is afraid if he gets caught he will be convicted of an offense that requires knowledge. So he hits on a kind of clever scheme. And the scheme is, hey, when these guys give me the, the car to drive across the border, I just won't look. And I won't look for a particular reason. And the particular reason for which I won't look is that if I'm caught, I'll be able to say truthfully, I didn't know. So it's a kind of way of contriving to avoid a criminal wrong, and I'm reluctant to allow someone to do that. So earlier I said to Stephen Morse that we don't want to allow people who are voluntarily intoxicated to somehow uh, become criminally liable for reckless conduct on the ground that had they been sober, they would have known something they didn't know, and they didn't know it because they were drunk. Well, I think that's right. We don't want to trace. I think uh, Stephen's right about that. And very few people who think about this issue in depth want to trace your blame to the earlier act of getting drunk. But now let's can think of a case in which the person contrives to get drunk. He knows perfectly well that he will do something awful when drunk. How does he know that? He's done it a hundred times before. So he thinks, here's a way of getting away with murder. I will just get myself really, really, really drunk. And then when I'm drunk, I won't know what I'm doing, but I know I'll kill when drunk. That kind of contrivance strikes me as enough to make someone liable for murder or in the analogous case of willful blindness, I'm willing to make an exception in that kind of case, but that's because I have a particular conception of what willful blindness involves, namely a motivation to be willfully blind for a particular reason. Uh, if you have some different motivation for being willfully blind, you just don't care, or uh, you're, you're lazy, well, that would make things altogether different. So that's the first comment about willful blindness. Ken will have a lot to say about this. I also want to say, and maybe this is the time to say something about whether the motivation for being ignorant of wrongdoing matters. Well, you know, uh, Gideon always teases me about my alleged modesty. Maybe he's right. Maybe we want an exception here, but I'm inclined to think otherwise. And I think the cases that test whether you want to make someone culpable for not knowing that something is wrong are the cases that Gideon, of course, is aware of and many of you are aware of, cases 
for example, of uh, ancient slave owners in practices in, in, in societies where slavery was fairly common. Uh, imagine you've got these ancient Hittites who enslave people. We all agree today slavery is objectively wrong. And what might have been their motivation for not knowing about the immorality of slavery? Suppose, now I'm going to tell a story, may not be true, but the story I'm telling is they just uh, had such little regard for the people they were enslaving. And because they had that kind of ill will toward the people they conquered in battle, they then enslaved them. And that was what prevented them from seeing what you and I would have seen, that the people they were enslaving had just the same moral status as you and I. And so they had ill will toward their slaves. Are we inclined to say of them that they are just as culpable, just as blameworthy as someone who enslaves someone knowing perfectly well that what he's doing is wrong, but enslaves because he or she doesn't want to do the hard work that his slaves are required to do. That's the kind of test case. I'm not sure that is your preferred test case, but it's certainly a test case for thinking about whether the motivation for being blind of, or wrong about the moral status of your wrongful act is or is not something that should partially or wholly exculpate. Thanks, Doug. I should say I have an admonishment here saying I have to keep everybody to short time so that everybody gets a chance to talk before before uh, 115. So uh, I don't know. I'm not good at following instructions. So but uh, Ken, speak. OK, and I'll try to be brief. But um, uh, and thanks, Gideon, for those helpful comments. And Doug, also for your, your uh, thoughts about this. I, on the question of whether I can really pull theory and practice apart the way I, to some extent, do in this paper. You're right that, that I ultimately can't do that. But I guess I see uh, I'll, my the, the, the point of the paper is being significantly interpretive. Uh, what are the doctrines the courts are using? What are some possible meanings of uh, prong one and prong two? I treat it as being a recklessness plus doctrine. At least there has to be recklessness and then something more. What's that something more? Can we define it? Um, you may well be right that there may be principled reasons for saying you don't even need recklessness, you don't need any awareness of risk, and you still should be able to elevate from negligence all the way up to knowledge. Um, so I need to think some more about that. But I, my focus has been on different ways to look some, at some form of a two-pronged approach. On the empirical studies, is there anything special about willful blindness that requires this inquiry? I mean, I, my initial thought going into this project was, yes, this is just a mess. I mean, I, 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 I really like this, the, this doctrine uh, 30 years ago when I first encountered it and started writing about it and thought it showed the deficiencies of the MPC cognitive approach to mental states. But then when I actually started reading cases, I, I saw courts were not at all clear. They often meant something more like negligence. They, they had no conception of what recklessness means uh, and whether this was really a recklessness plus concept. But then as I look further, I see that they're also not terribly good about defining knowledge or defining plain old recklessness. So I do think it's really important that we be more consistent and clear uh, in our use of mens rea language, given the enormous impact it has on, on criminal punishment and, and on criminal defendants. Is mens rea more important than other criminal law issues? Absolutely not. I mean, consent, it's really important to see how ordinary people understand that too. There's a recent piece you're probably familiar with by Roseanne Summers about that. She comes up with a view that coercion really shouldn't matter very much for purposes of consent. I wouldn't actually draw that conclusion, but it's interesting to see what popular understandings are. So I think throughout the criminal law, we should make sure that we're defining concepts in ways that can be clearly and consistently applied uh, by juries. And then just quickly on, on Doug's point about uh, isn't it really the, the, the particular motive to avoid criminality that's the best case for saying we use willful blindness and elevate recklessness to knowledge? 
That might, that's one of the strong cases. My view actually tends to be that any highly culpable reason for not acquiring knowledge uh, could be equivalent to knowledge in, in overall in culpability. Uh, and for example, I mean, here's another type of example. Suppose someone is selling alcohol to an underage person at a store and suspects that it's not a valid ID um, but doesn't look super closely and is really distracted. And why is she distracted? Because she's uh, planning with other people in the store to commit some serious crime. Okay, that's a highly culpable reason for not acquiring knowledge. That seems like a, as good a reason as the desire to avoid criminality to elevate her recklessness up to knowledge, even if she actually never actually acquires knowledge. So, um, I'm not, I'm not convinced that the purpose to avoid criminality is in principle the only good reason or, or, uh, or by far the best reason uh, for, uh, uh, for treating something as willfully blind. But then on the other hand, I also uh, agree with the courts that have emphasized that, that at least that's a narrow test, at least that keeps willful blindness within reasonable grant uh, limits. So there, there's something to be said for it on that ground. So I'll, I'll stop at that. Thank you. Um, following the alphabetical order principle, Shauna, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I think we have about 25 questions on the table, which is good. It's always good to have more <laughs> rather than less. Um, but I think for me, uh, I'm going to add a 26 question, and which is sort of where we, where we, where I started uh, this 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 whole exercise, and I think that this conference is really valuable because it does bring theorists um, and, and even philosophers to the table with uh, reformers. And I think we don't do that enough, and so I appreciate that. Was um, sort of a surprise to me because so I started reading Doug's paper, and the first question that his paper asks is, should ignorance of wrongdoing absolve the wrongdoer from blame, liability, and punishment? And I say, yes, the answer is profoundly yes and immediately yes, if what you're talking about is criminal blame, criminal liability, and criminal punishment. And I thought, I don't need to read the rest of this paper. And now I find out from Gideon that apparently that view is provocative and radical, which would not be the first time I was called either. Um, but, but still, I didn't know that this was actually so contested. And I, but I, I do realize that it must be because Doug wouldn't have bothered to waste a paper explaining it if it wasn't. And so as I read the rest of his paper, I tried to figure out why it was such a immediate answer for me. And it is obvious because it is coming from my experience as a criminal defense lawyer. I, my interactions sitting next to people who were accused of crimes from the government and sitting next to them and being near them and their families as they were accused pled guilty or found guilty, incarcerated, and then came out of incarceration, I realize probably more than the general public, but certainly not more than anybody else who's on this call, that the criminal sanction is so severe and so draconian and so, frankly, for me, almost immoral in the U.S. that the answer has to be that we apply that criminal sanction as infrequently as we can. So yes, so, so not only to the types of conduct we criminalize, but certainly if there is any question as to a mistake of law or a mistake of knowledge, all, so mistakes of law or fact, they should be absolved as crim of criminal culpability as well. What I, what's interesting to me is that it is ba that is based on a practical reality of our criminal system though, and not necessarily a good philosophical argument. So for example, I know that there are thousands of reformers who are focused as we speak on changing what American jails look like, on changing what happens to people when they are in and what happens to people when they come out. If they were successful in their work and they were able to change what is to me an almost immoral response. What happens when someone is put in jail and what happens when they come out? 
if we were, if we could fundamentally change that and people and, and our prisons looked more like something from other first world European countries, for example, and people got the emotional, psychological, medical and financial support when they were coming back out. I, my, my answer to the question of whether in, wrongdoers who are ignorant should be criminally punished or not would probably change. So that for me, that's sort of interesting that I, I, I thought I knew the philosophical answer to this question, but I realized in reading this paper that the answer for me is, is purely housed in practicalities. And I'm not sure that's the best way for a reformer to look at the system. I, I appreciate that there are people saying, well, okay, but let's say we fix that. Just how does this whole thing work, um, you know, broadly? But but having said that, I that that is the reality that people are facing. Um, and I and I think that no matter how hard I work as a reformer, the last day I take my last breath on earth, things won't be as as good as I would hope that anyone I know would have to deal with. And so because of that, I would say that we all have to remember lawmakers, public people, law, lawyers, academics, that there is the civil law. The civil law is a mechanism by which you can assign blame, liability, punishment, and even restitution to victims. We have a massive amount of civil enforcement in this country from the government. As individuals, we can also civilly enforce laws against each other. And I would rather see a large, a significantly larger amount of um, prosecution, if you will, move over to the civil side and allow and allow the civil law to take care of those things. And, and it certainly includes everywhere where there was a mistake of law or a mistake of fact. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Vikrit? Thanks so much. It's a, a real honor to be here. I want to say thanks to Arizona State and to Michael for inviting me to do this. I'll also note, by the way, Judge Rykoff started his uh, comments yesterday by joking that he was a bit intimidated because he said that uh, the study showed that the students who got the best grades in law school went on to become law professors. I will say that I'm a bit intimidated because when I was in college, it was said, and I never knew if this was, this was true, it was said that the kids who got the highest scores on the LSATs were the philosophy majors. So, uh, Shanna, we are here with three philosophers, and it's a little bit intimidating, but we'll muddle yes. along and do our best. Um, I love the papers. I love that Gideon repeatedly called them provocative, because they are provocative. They are, uh, they are pushing against doctrines that, are, um, uh, that have been consecrated in our law for a long, long time, uh, centuries, in fact, uh, certainly when it comes to uh, not permitting uh, mistake of law defenses. And I'm not a revolutionary, so I'm, I'm generally not somebody uh, who wants to dramatically alter the law. I feel like if some principle has been there for a long time, it's probably there for a good reason. And yet, uh, I do think that both the papers were probably onto something with their provocativeness. I probably had different reasons for getting to the same place that both Doug and Ken got to, and, and they're sort of like Shana's. I'm just more... Um, grounded in the practical application of these ideas. Uh, but as I look through my kind of pragmatic lens, I, I got to the same place as Ken and Doug. And I got there for basically one reason. I feel like these principles and these ideas were developed in a world where the criminal law was dramatically different. In fact, to be really direct, it was dramatically smaller. It was perfectly reasonable uh, to say in the past, whenever somebody said, I don't know if anybody ever did say this, but if anybody ever said, oh, I didn't realize it was against the law to kill that man, well, that's completely absurd. Obviously, that you're not going to permit a mistake of law defense in a case like that. Or uh, to take Ken's paper, I understand uh, and think it is reasonable um, to ask of somebody, look, when somebody just kind of handed you a package and said, deliver this for me, but don't open it up, the fact that you just, you know, chose not to investigate at all uh, seems like a problem to us. I can, I can understand that logic too. But we're talking about a world right now with thousands upon thousands of criminal laws. And in the world that we live in right now, for people to say things like, I honestly did not know that was a crime. Kind of sounds reasonable to me. And uh, I also think in a world with thousands upon thousands of criminal laws, it's worth asking, 
what kind of investigation are we really expecting of people on a day-to-day -day basis about their conduct? There's a, uh, there's a uh, Twitter feed that a bunch of people here probably know called Crime A Day. This blog just literally tweets out a different federal crime every single day. I, I looked up today's crime. For those who are curious, it is a crime to depict a fruit or vegetable on the label of a beverage if the juices, color, taste, or other organoleptic properties have been modified to the extent that the original juice is no longer recognizable. He tweets out something like this every single day. He's been doing it for six years. And at this point, he is only approximately 0.7% of the way through what he knows to be uh, all the federal crimes. And by the way, that's just federal laws. We're not even getting into state and local ordinances. And so we're just in a very, very different world with, uh, with regard to the criminal law. Uh, Professor Hopwood yesterday was talking about this case that's pending in the Supreme Court, Van Buren, which gets into the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And there are all these provisions within the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that criminalize behavior that seems fairly ordinary. Uh, I think Sean was talking yesterday about accessing somebody else's Facebook page. Suppose you access your girlfriend's Facebook page without her knowledge. I think this is arguably a crime. Now, it's uh, under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. I think that most people would probably say, yeah, there's something about that seems sketchy or immoral or weird or creepy. But I honestly doubt that most Americans would say that is a criminal activity. I don't think that they would put that kind of really profound moral valence on that, uh, on that action. I also think you could say, look, before you access somebody else's Facebook page, you probably should go to the Facebook Terms of Service and just get a handle on whether or not it's appropriate to do that. But again, realistically, I just don't think that that's the kind of thing that you can ask of people in the modern world. And I think that uh, law really has to be uh, consonant with the way that people actually think and live. If it's gonna have any legitimacy. So I'm gonna close actually um, by giving a kind of a, some personal thoughts uh, and, and maybe confessing to some personal crimes here uh, based on what I've been thinking the most about this year in 2020. And what I've been thinking the most about professionally and even to some extent personally is the explosion, minor explosion of criminal law and criminal sanctions due to the pandemic. There have been all of these different ordinances that have come out about mask wearing, about the number of people and kinds of people you can associate with, about quarantining rules, things like this. And I will confess to everybody uh, on this call, all 52 of you, that I have not a, done a very good job of keeping up with what all of the rules are. And I'm really just kind of trying to muddle along and do the best that I can, because I don't have a lot of time to sit around and get on all the different websites and read up on what all the ordinances are on a day-to-day -day level. Uh, I think I do a pretty good job. I'm at the point right now where I wear my mask pretty much all the time because I'm comfortable with it. But early on, I'm gonna confess to this, it just, I didn't wear these masks all the time. And so whenever there was an excuse to maybe not have to wear it, I, I would try and take it off and tuck it in my pocket. And maybe there were times when I was breaking the law. So for example, I would go to public parks with my son, he's two years old. And if I was in that park all by myself, just me and him, you know, why wear the mask? Well, on one hand, you probably should wear it because there's playground equipment and other people will come and you'll end up breathing on all of it. Uh, on the other hand, I don't know, I'm outdoors. Everybody keeps saying that if you're outside, things are better, it's all right, it's fine. In the end, it was really just kind of a moment to moment, to, do I feel comfortable right now? Do I not feel comfortable right now? But it's very possible that repeatedly I was breaking the law. And it's also quite clear, because I've confessed to this, that I didn't go and investigate whether I did or didn't. I was fine in the end. Uh, Oh, and by the way, let me also confess to another thing. I live in Washington, D.C., so at any given moment, um, I could have been in Maryland or Virginia or Washington, D.C., and I didn't get online to determine what the various laws were in every single jurisdiction. I'm sure they differed. I was fine, and uh, nobody ever said anything to me, but it's possible that the reason nobody ever said anything to me is that there's something about the way I dress or the way I speak that makes police officers not particularly suspicious of me. 
not everybody is in that position. Now, I wonder about people who were uh, uh, you know, necessary critical workers, working blue collar jobs, who are also you know, desperately trying to figure out their childcare situation, who just did not have time. Maybe in my case, it was laziness. But there are certain people who simply don't have time to go and figure out what all the various pandemic laws are. And maybe they look a certain way that draws suspicion from law enforcement. And maybe they get pulled into adversarial conversations from time to time. And, and this is why, you know, even though a lot of my friends in the public health community have been really, really serious about strong mandates around uh, pandemic laws, I've been a little more skeptical. I wonder about the kinds of people who get pulled into these things. But anyway, I've only got one minute left. And I just wanted to mention that it was this pandemic that I thought a lot about as I read Doug's paper and as I read Ken's paper. I can imagine people saying, well, we're kind of, you know, don't get too spun up about this stuff. These are just very tiny misdemeanors. It's not such a big deal. My response to that would be, you know, it, misdemeanors are 80% of the criminal justice system. You know, the little $100 fine is, is quite a big deal to a lot of people. 13 million people are charged with misdemeanors each year. So I am skeptical of these doctrines. There's an old line from Oliver Wendell Holmes. I won't quote it exactly, but it's something to the effect of it's revolting to keep a law in the book simply because it happened to be there when Henry IV was, uh, was ruling. Uh, I think there's uh, a lot of wisdom in that. And I, I do think it's worth looking at these doctrines with a very critical eye. And I'm glad that both Doug and Ken did from their more philosophical um, rather than policy-based perspective. Thanks so much. Thanks. Um, so we're going to take a five minute break now. See you in five minutes. Uh, waiting on Ken here, but I imagine he'll be turning on his video any minute. There he is. Um, so very good. I wanted to first just begin by giving Doug and Ken in that order the opportunity to say a word in response to the uh, commentator's remarks. And then I'm going to open it up for, um, for questions from anybody who has any. Um, I personally have access to the raise the hand feature. So if you want to use that, please do or put your question in the chat. Either way, I, I think I should be able to get to you. So, um, yeah, Doug, why don't you respond first? Sure, thank you, Gideon, good job. And uh, Shana, is it Shana or Shauna? I'm so sorry. It's Shana, like banana. Shana, okay. And Vikran, I'm, I'm delighted to have uh, advocates or people who are allies who agree with me, uh, radical or not. Uh, and so I should, I suppose, take my allies wherever I can find them. On the other hand, there's something that's a little worrisome. I think both of you indicated that you shared the view that I have for something like pragmatic reasons or something of that sort. And that kind of worries me because if you look at the history of the doctrine that ignorance of law or ignorance of wrongdoing is no defense, you find that the defenses of it are solely pragmatic and it's supposed to be too hard to prove that people are ignorant or that you will have a hard time. Uh, so many people will lie about their ignorance or you don't want to incentivize ignorance. All these are kinds of consequentialist arguments. And so I would think if you want to be on the level of pragmatics, you're going to have a much harder time than I do with the same conclusion that we all share. I mean, I just think on substantive moral argument, it's not so difficult to show that in virtually all cases, I, I believe that the ignorant wrongdoer is less culpable than someone who commits the very same crime, knowing perfectly well that what he does is wrong. So I just thought I would mention that there's so much to say here, but I think I'll stop right there. I know I, for one, if I could just say very quickly, I, I did not mean to suggest that I only agreed with your premise um, because of pragmatism 
practical reasons and pragmatic reasons. I actually ag completely agree with you. I do think that um, just my practical experience as a criminal defense lawyer, as opposed to say a prosecutor, led me to also understand just how important this question is. Uh, right, I, I echo uh, Shannon's remarks, but I'll just say, I, I definitely use the word pragmatic, but uh, uh, I, I take your point that there are pragmatic arguments on the other side, and I've always, all, you know, kind of been, I found that argument really interesting that uh, you don't want to incentivize ignorance, you don't want people to go out of their way to desperately try not to learn about the law. There are pragmatic arguments on the other side too, and I, uh, I agree, I take that. Ken, you wanna jump in? Yeah, let me uh, just comment on a couple of, on something that Shannon said and, and one of uh, Vikram's uh, comments. One thing you mentioned, Shannon, and I largely agree with you is that civil, civil law should be used more uh, rather than the criminal law and an awful lot of areas we currently use the criminal law. I, I'm a scholar and teacher of torts as well as criminal law, so I'm quite familiar with that uh, argument and the importance of that. Uh, and I think especially for minor crimes and regulatory crimes, that's often a much more suitable thing. There's much too great a tendency for legislators to think, oh, here's a big social problem my constituents are upset about, let's, let's criminalize it. Uh, and never mind the resources or the stigma or the disproportionality of the punishment. However, I, I do think there are limits to the ability of tort law or regulatory law to address certain problems. Um, if a defendant uh, doesn't have assets or insurance, then, and they commit a serious fraud, I think we do need to uh, be open to the possibility that maybe a criminal sanction is appropriate, both for attributive and deterrence reasons. So I, I tend to agree with you uh, to, to an extent, but I'm not sure that's gonna be a, a complete answer. And then, on, Vikran's uh, point about what kind of investigation can we fairly expect people to conduct? I hadn't really thought about it from this perspective, but this is sort of from a uh, uh, reaction to both of you. Maybe willful blindness should really just be limited to more serious crimes. I mean, if we're asking for people to undertake what sometimes is a burden, uh, interference with other relationships, um, uh, other kinds of burdens of having to conduct an investigation, perhaps willful blindness shouldn't be imposed in minor crimes. And of course, one huge problem with willful blindness is it's very popular. I think it was initially um, became popular, at least in the United States, in drug crimes. And we probably shouldn't have nearly as many drug crimes as we currently do. But, uh, but for other kinds of crimes, uh, if it's in a de defensible doctrine, maybe we should limit it to more serious ones and not water down the knowledge requirement uh, for uh, misdemeanors or, or less serious crimes. I mean, Vikrant's point about what kind of investigation do we expect of people uh, applies probably even most when we are talking about uh, corporate, how this applies in the corporate law context or a white collar prosecution, right? The question is a bribery occurred, which is a serious crime. Uh, a, a bribery occurs in India, but the prosecution is after an individual executive from the C-suite who's never left his office in Kansas. So how much does that person, how much is that person expected to investigate what someone in his 4,000, 40,000, 400,000 employee company did. And these are very real questions. And so uh, we, we and to determine that someone's liability rests on, well, but you should have known because it's your company. Really, it makes maybe more sense for someone who runs a company with three people than with 3,000 or three or 300,000. But I mean, so, so I guess, uh, we're, I'm, I'm really intrigued with how that question about how, what, what exactly do we expect? And I think as soon as you're talking about what people should have known, all of a sudden we're really, it, whatever the answer to that question is, the answer can't be, it will, and if you should have known more, then you get to go to jail because you didn't. I mean, it, it, that, is a, that is a perfect place where the civil law can be a remedy, I think. Right, though. Janet, uh, no, I'll let you go. also just, just say that, 
I think intuitively to most people, one of the most compelling cases for using willful blindness is the case of the corporate executive who not only, not merely was negligent and should have known, but who deliberately put practices into place to create plausible deniability. Don't tell me about such and such. Just you know, get me the bottom line results, even though I suspect that in order to do so, you're gonna to have to bribe someone. Uh, so insofar as uh, corporate and uh, white collar defendants sometimes have greater ability to create structures of plausible deniability, they can more easily uh, avoid knowledge liability and the case for willful blindness is somewhat stronger. And the, then the counter argument I think is well, but willful blindness is in fact used against a lot of minority uh, defendants, a lot of uh, drug crimes, uh, a lot of low level, level crimes where we don't have quite the same intuitive reaction. Right. Well, I'm never going to um, approach the law as, you know, we should have sort of one approach for white collar folks and one approach for, and I don't think you were suggesting that, but I'm very sensitive to that because I've represented people from all walks of life and it feels just as unfair. Uh, when you have a poor client is when you have one that could afford your rate but is still walk, going to jail and whose whose life has been permanently damaged by this but i but to your point that's exactly why i really love the second prong of the global tech standard um and why i think most criminal defense lawyers out there when we saw the supreme court come out with that standard actually rejoice because you're right there's four at least four different approaches and we all thought that that one was the best one. And I thought that was interesting that you, in your paper, you suggest that maybe you, your favorite is a different one. But, but because that second prong in global talk actually says that you must have deliberate actions to avoid learning or avoid investigating. And I think that gets exactly to this point of the fear that, in, like, that somebody rich or with a big company could set up purposeful systems to not look or can engage in complicated plausible deniability schemes those are, in fact, deliberate actions to avoid investigation. And so I think that if, if you have to have something like willful blindness, having it as circumscribed and as concrete as possible makes the most amount of sense. As opposed to saying, just pegging it to something I think um, Gideon mentioned, which was just the sense of that, that they, the, the motivation for somebody doing something, um, that willful blindness should be, should be gauged by whether someone in, you know, what their motivation was and if they were engaging in failure to investigate because they wanted to avoid liability. The only problem I have with that is, and maybe I'm misunderstanding what that means, I feel like any prosecutor anywhere would always say, of course that was the motivation. Why would anyone, why would a prosecutor ever, why would there ever be a case in any circumstances where that wouldn't be the accusation and where you could presume? Because the, the reality is what happened was in fact, a violation of the law. So if you have a violation of the law and then you have a person in front of you, then you would say, well, you failed to look because you know if you did look and you did find something, it would be a violation. So that, you know, sort of like arguendo, it was, you were poorly motivated. And so I just feel like that might get us to a place where then a willful blindness applied to every, everyone. Um, but maybe again, that is colored by my, uh, my, my prejudice from being in practice and well, I might jump in actually quickly on, on that point, which is just, uh, it, it's certainly going to be the case that there's, there are going to be a lot of cases where somebody didn't inquire, and then there's various possible motives for why they didn't inquire. Now, in, so something which actually, which uh, uh, a meaningful and willful blindness doctrine should require prosecution to positively show that their motive for not inquiring was a problematic motive. Um, so notice, incidentally, that's already in the second prong of the of the global tech standard, so they've got to deliberately take steps, right? right? Those deliberate steps, you've got to show something about what the motivation was for those steps, and so showing that they took a step, which and thanks to the step, they didn't inquire. They had information. You need to know why it is that that step was taken. You need to show that that step was taken in order to keep themselves in the dark. You're going to be a long way towards uh, towards what I'm talking about right there. I should note, actually, incidentally, the kind of what Ken just described is the paradigm case. CEO who puts in lots of puts in place lots of stuff for plausible deniability, not going to satisfy in many many cases not going to satisfy the first prong of global tech. Because um, if you have effective enough mechanisms in place, they're not even going to be aware of high probabilities. 
are going to be kept in the dark even about that. So, um, so that's that's going to be an argument, I think, against the the first prong of the global tech standard. Um, but I'm sorry, I, I'm moderating. I should be backing out of this a little bit. No, but, um, no, but I appreciate that. And but uh, the language in global tech second prong is actions. And for me, I guess um, when I'm sitting there thinking about how I could defend a person, that the mere fact that there are actions you can point to seems fair to me. Like you took this particular action, and when you use the word motive. Uh, around, around me, I think that you're now trying to get at a mental state and a prosecutor will always argue and will be always be able to argue that the motive was a bad one. So they get to argue that I get to say no, it wasn't and try to give other reasons, but I just feel like it's sort of an unfair burden because there will always be the answer or you did it for another reason. And so it just doesn't give me much to defend a person with, whereas I really like a more concrete, you took actual steps and the court or the jury isn't being, or even a prosecutor, because let's be honest, none of these cases go to trial, that a, that a prosecutor doesn't get to say, mm, you know, you don't have much to argue with and do you really want to go to a jury trial on this because you don't, I don't have to prove action. I should just uh, add, but I'm, I'm interested in, in seeing uh, how courts have interpreted that global tech second prong, but the Seventh Circuit still has this rule that a decision not to inquire is sufficient action or is sufficient under the second prong. Uh, they don't really require you take any concrete steps. They don't require you to destroy a document or move something from one place right. to another or tell uh, your co-employee to, you know, to not follow up when they normally would. Uh, so that makes it extraordinarily broad. I have no idea how, as a practical matter, you can tell whether someone's made a decision not to inquire or has simply negligently forgotten to inquire or declined to inquire. Uh, and uh, if, if that's what all this turns on, it's a very thin read. Which is why we're going to have, you know, another hundred cases where people try to seek cert uh, before the Supreme Court because this is an answer. It is an unanswered question whether the global tech standard applies in criminal cases because it was a civil case. And every defense lawyer I know will argue that it is because it's the better, the, one of the more practical, concrete versions of this test and not quite as bad as some of the, the many others. But, you know, it'll take, it'll take 50 years for the Supreme Court to answer that question for us. I'd like to say real quickly that the focus on a duty to inquire, which so many people invoke in this context, often seems to me to be something of a red herring. Let's take a case where someone clearly has a duty to inquire and doesn't inquire. He's lazy. He's a surgeon. He's going to perform surgery tomorrow. He's not very sure how to do it. The textbooks tell him he is too lazy to find out. He goes ahead, botches the operation. Well, what do we want to say about him? My question is whether we would want to equate his culpability for botching the operation with that of a physician who deliberately knowingly botched the operation. Clearly, I think the answer is no. For so, Kraut, you wanted to get in earlier. Do you still? Uh, no, Shanna, Shanna and I have worked together in the past, so I, I think sometimes she's anticipating what I'm going to say before I say it. <laughs> that's what happened with that previous all response. Right, but, I'm right, actually but. just kind of thinking about, no, that's all right. I'm thinking about Doug's um, his hypothetical there. I, I don't know if I would treat those situations differently. I don't know if that's clear to me. I don't know. Shanna, what do you think? Um... I guess I'm trying to think about a, a, a how this would even, how the question of whether this doctor's behavior would be covered by something like willful blindness would even sort of come up. To me, it would, it's sort of the, the, the harm, the crime here would be you harmed a person. And what I don't, is there like a, is the person dead? So is this a murder prosecution that, I guess, and I just don't, I'm guessing that the prosecutor wouldn't go under a willful blindness argument for trying to assign culpability in that case. But I, I guess that's not, um, my answer then is I'm not gonna play along with the question, which isn't, which isn't fair. I, I guess, uh, as you describe it, Doug, the first doctor sounds like, uh, it sounds to me like his conduct is reckless. And I guess this kind of gets to some of what Ken was talking about, uh, some of the empirical studies at the end of his paper about how um, 
the most difficult thing for people to distinguish, uh, you know, ordinary people when they're asked about the different mens rea categories is the difference between knowledgeable and reckless. Uh, that's probably a good example of that. And actually, I mean, if I can maybe add one thing to that is, is um, the model penal code itself, which a lot of people have been uh, elevating as sort of a sacred text over these last couple of days, there are a lot of great things in the model penal code, but there's some sloppy drafting when they, when you see, when you look at how they contrast recklessness with knowledge. In recklessness, the, the definition is conscious disregard of a substantial risk. In knowledge, it's simply aware of a practical certainty that you'll bring about a result or aware of a high probability of a fact. But there's no language of disregard. And I emphasize this because in some of the studies, empirical studies I was involved with, we gave various scenarios to people uh, and asked them, you know, uh, fit these into the categories of either negligent or reckless or knowledge, and we used the MPC definitions. A lot of people, if they thought somebody acted really, really badly, they, they call it conscious disregard, reckless, rather than knowledge, even though it actually was a case of knowledge. Why did they do that? Because the language of disregard is there. And that's a very evocative, normative notion. Uh, and as a matter of parallel, and, and also I think may, another reason is knowledge is generally a good thing. So to, for someone to be found to have acted with knowledge, okay, well, it's good that we're all knowing. Um, they should have used some parallel construction. Uh, conscious they should use the conscious disregard language in both recklessness and knowledge in the definition or in neither. We did actually try to empirically test for that and it did change results a little bit. So I think that's part of the reason that uh, a lot of ordinary folks when they see MPC definitions don't know how to distinguish them, but it's not the whole thing. I think it's, I think the word reckless itself uh, if that's part, that itself has an evocative meaning, even without the language of disregard, whereas, again, the language knowledge uh, doesn't have that uh, uh, negative connotation to it. So this is all in sort of pursuit of a more ideal, a better criminal code or better jury instructions that are much clearer about what these mens rea categories actually uh, are supposed to mean in language that ordinary people can understand. And so that the, the these distinctions that can make huge difference to the time that a person serves in prison uh, or whether they are, are convicted at all uh, can actually be uh, accurately and consistently applied. So um, <clears throat> Alex Sarch is interested in asking a question. Uh, so I think he should definitely do that, especially since he just Here's a plug for Alex's new book on willful ignorance. So um, Alex, please ask away. If you want to turn on your video, that'd be great. Hey, thanks so much. Um, so uh, nothing about the book in my question. Um, so that was totally unnecessary. Um, but I've really enjoyed the conversation. It's been just terrific to, to, to hear this go back and forth. Um, so I've, I've got a quick question for Ken um, and a slightly meatier question for Doug. If, is it okay if I sort of do both or I don't know what the queue looks like? Okay, great. Um, so question for Ken, uh, kind of standing up on empirical, uh, standing up for empirical stuff in response to Gideon. Um, so I wondered if the following was, was your view, um, right? So um, it sounded to me like you're not proposing to sort of fix concepts or sort of determine uh, what the correct sort of conception of knowledge, for example, or willful blindness should be by reference to empirical results. Rather, it sounded like you're proposing, look, we want a well-theorized ideal view, but some simplifications or implementation compromises are going to be needed. And we need to test those in the wild to figure out which ones work best. So we avoid sort of um, unintended bad consequences, for example. Um, so since we're stuck with the willful ignorance doctrine insofar as we are going to fix it, let's, let's try to figure out which one will um, sort of, which, which possible version, which clarification of which prong, for example, um, would be most important to get right. And the empirics can tell us something about those kinds of things. Um, I mean, you've got this terrific list of sort of facially confusing things in the paper um, that come up with the way the willful blindness doctrine is 
implemented and some might be more important than others. And um, you can determine a lot by testing different versions of the jury instructions empirically. Um, and I think anyone who's 100% wedded to theory would still be really happy with that because whatever theoretically best result is, uh, is um, we come up with, we're gonna have to implement it. So, so I took it that was your view and I just wanted to see if that, if, if, um, if that captured your um, sort of uh, the role of empirical work in your approach here in response to Gideon. Um, I mean, again, so that was question one. You have to say very briefly, yes, absolutely. I'm trying to sort of find the best version of willful blindness that can accomplish what its supposed purpose and function is and see if that is one that, that juries can indeed consistently apply. And, and you shouldn't be so modest about your book. Your book is incredibly helpful for anyone who's interested in willful blindness. Buy Alex's book on culpable ignorance. It's, it's a real, it's, it's really important. Um, <laughs> thanks, I'm very embarrassed at the moment. <laughs> um, I'm gonna barrel ahead to my second question, Gideon, if that's still okay. Um, so, so I guess for Doug, I was wondering if, um, so people who think there can be negligence liability, are they gonna be able to have an easy time accepting your full-fledged view that ignorance of law should always excuse? Um, and, and I was wondering in particular what you thought about an intermediary position for people who like, like me who think, well, there could be, I think some criminal negligence liability uh, seems okay, so I'm not quite Larry and Kim, um, but but for people uh, like me who think it's or or maybe like like Stephen from the last session who are maybe more ambivalent, could there be an intermediate version of the view, um, and would you be happy with that? So the idea would be ignorance of law excuses um, only sometimes, especially in those esoteric kinds of cases or the kinds of cases Vikrant was talking about. I mean, with the proliferation of COVID regulations, um, I mean th the thought here is that or the underlying intuition is that sometimes you really just should know um, what the law is, what the relevant standard is. It's sufficiently easy to access for people like us that you can reason from it. Um, so, so you'd be culpable if you didn't know that the act you're doing is wrong for some really core mala and say kinds of behaviors, for example. Um, and in those cases, it seems okay uh, for, for ignorance of law not to excuse. Um, uh, and so the cases where it seems most plausible um, to, to allow ignorance to excuse are the esoteric or sort of cases where it's not reasonable to expect that we would um, you know, know the relevant laws. And I think you're gonna respond here by saying, well, yes, um, you know, um, maybe sometimes we should know the law, but even so not doing it with knowledge that it's illegal is still worse than sort of doing it while you didn't know that it was illegal, but should have. Um, and so I think that's probably plausible. Um, but the difference in those really core mala and say cases seems to be very small. So I could totally understand a legislature would just lump them together and say, you know, um, if you if it was blindingly obvious to anyone in your position, maybe someone with your professional sort of your license to do a certain kind of activity. So we expect right that it would be blindingly obvious to you, um, or it's a core mala and say kind of case. Um, wouldn't it be justifiable for the legislature to treat that the same? Um, as if you you actually did know. So that would be a case where um, you don't allow ignorance of law to to excuse. Um, but for the ones where it really is not reasonable for us to uh, for us to expect that you would know the law, allow the law to allow ignorance of law to excuse there. So what about that um, intermediary position for people like me who think kind of negligence liability should have known um, can sometimes generate culpability as well? Um, what do you think of that intermediary intermediary position? Thanks. So I, I love it when I get a question and an answer to the question at the same time. So I think you've anticipated what I'm inclined to say. Surely Vikram is right that if you look at these esoteric laws, the case for allowing an ignorance of law defense in those circumstances is going to be much stronger than in cases of malum and say. And you'll find any number of people who think that you want to differentiate between malum and say and malum prohibitum with respect to the question of whether ignorance of wrongdoing should be a defense. I'm willing to go all the way to the radical position. And so I want to imagine a dialogue between, uh, take the perpetrator of uh, some of the most uh, awful atrocities you can think of in the 20th century or 21st century. So here's Osama bin Laden 
who killed a few uh, thousand people who were innocent and uh, imagine him applying uh, to the pearly gates and he confronts St. Peter. You don't need to remind me, I'm mixing religious traditions here. So here's St. Peter and uh, Osama bin Laden and St. Peter says, well, I'd love to love, let you in. Uh, you've you know, done a lot of good things in your life, but you did kill a few thousand innocent people. That's a Malam and say, any reasonable person should know that that's wrong. And bin Laden is gonna say, oh, well, you're right. I did something awful. I, uh, I should not be here. He's gonna say, but, but I thought it was right. I thought I was doing it for your glory. I thought my interpretation of the book that I believe you wrote indicated that this is the kind of thing that you would reward me for doing. I didn't know what I was doing was wrong. Even a monster like that who did the most egregious mala in say in the 21st century of anyone I can think of, even he, I think has a case that he's not as culpable as if he had said, yeah, I know this was wrong, but you know, I did it because uh, I, uh, there's money in it for me or something like that. He is not as culpable as the person who knowingly does the malam and say. And so even in those cases, I'm willing to differentiate their culpability. That is perhaps what's radical about my view, but I want to stick to it. Uh, thanks. Oh, go ahead and follow up, Alex, if you want. Well, just, I mean, do you think that it would be acceptable for the, the sort of, for, for the legislature to treat the, so even if you grant that reply that there's some mitigation, um, if you have, you're fully convinced of your own righteousness and doing a really bad thing, slightly less culpable than someone who knows that full well that what they're doing is wrong, but that there's some cases where we're talking about degrees of culpability um, or degrees of harm that are so large that um, it'd be justified for a, a legislature to lump them together as approximately equally culpable. Um, I wonder if that might be for the Bin Laden case, for example. I, I tend to think the difference in culpability is sufficiently great that I don't want to lump them together. So it seems to me quite a bit of difference between someone who knowingly kills thousands of people knowing it's wrong and someone who kills thousands of people believing it's right. It's not just a trivial little difference that would justify legislators in smoothing over a culpable difference. It seems to me to be quite a, 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 a huge gap, but you know, it's hard to know how to quantify the size of a gap. I'm gonna call on Josh Kleinfeld next, but I wanna just insert one quick thing first. Um, the uh, much discussion today already in this session about cases like the crime a day kind of case, um, you know, or these trivial, trivial offenses, things that look like maybe there's a civil offense here, maybe there isn't even that, which where we're attaching criminal liability at the federal level. And I guess the question is, I mean, do you really believe that the right, I mean, just as, as we're thinking as reformers, so I guess this is really a question for Shanna and Vikram. Thinking as reformers, do you think that the right reform there is a default rule of mens rea of the kind that, that Doug is advocating? Or is the default rule, or is the right reform is to try to take a lot of these offenses off the books and throw them into some civil liability if you right. possibly can? I mean, I mean so, I mean, right. like, even if you know that, you sh that it's against the law to put a picture of a juice that you can't taste on the bottle, uh, who cares? You're still not criminally culpable in light of having done that. It's just too stupid a thing for the, for criminal liability to attach to. For me, the answer is that, and I'm sure for, for Grant would agree with me, there's hundreds of thousands, probably 300,000 extra federal laws that you could just get rid of and, and turn into civil liability like that. And then of the federal statutes, there's about, what, 4,500 of those that are sort of more regularized and not really regulatory you know, maybe even half of those could go because the other, the other thing, and this is important, is that we have state criminal codes that are maybe closer to a model penal code approach, not, not in the specifics, but that it's actually a code. The federal government does not have a code at all. It just has hundreds of thousands of just stuff thrown on a wall, frankly. So maybe allowing a lot of these things to be prosecuted in, in a more particular way in, a way, in a more codified way by their states would also be a good approach and something that I've always supported, even though I'm not a conservative who has this like sort of fundamental federalist principle that's driving that idea. But, but also, and importantly, I think, I think sometimes somebody yesterday asked the question, well, wouldn't it make more sense instead of going with the default rule to just go through the 
the all federal law and take one after time and then say what's the right thing to do for this particular crime because we can sit here all day and throw out well what about this example and what about this example and and maybe some of us would would stand our ground no matter what and and be and be dug and then some of us would be like oh wait no that kind of crime is different and and i will say that a lot of people on the ground like in the public and also the lawmakers who decide these things are much more like anyone else and would say and are much like what um, molly from fam was talking about yesterday they don't like certain groups of people and so for some people it's the poor and for some people it's it's people of color and for some people it's white color offenders and so as you approach each one of these crimes it's on it your your view about what the mens rea level should be how hard it should be to prosecute is really what we're asking it depends on how you feel about corporations and what they do versus how you feel about a person sleeping on a sidewalk you know when they when they are experiencing homelessness or how you feel about drugs and we're in wildly different places about this country so so the answer is yes wouldn't it be great to go each crime and, and go crime by crime and try to figure out what the answer is per each crime but it's it's practically impossible and if we did i don't even think you could get five of us to sit around the room and come up with the same mens rea answer to all of this so good luck to any of us figuring this out I, I, yeah. I guess I come from the point of view that it just shouldn't be easy to prosecute a person in this country of anything because that's that's offensive to me from a liberty lover point of view and also because I understand what the criminal sanction means to people. So I get upset when people are sort of talking about the answers to these questions and saying, well, isn't that going to make it harder to prosecute? The answer for me is always, and shouldn't it? Because it should never be easy. But I understand that other people don't feel that way. Yeah, I agree with you, Shanna. It's, um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I just think we should get rid of a whole bunch of these laws. And on the one hand, I think that's the kind of Occam's razor solution. That's the elegant one, right? Don't really tinker with all of the fundamental doctrines and principles. Just get this stuff out of the code. But I don't know, when I stop and think about it, you're right that maybe that's not the Occam's razor solution because it's just way too difficult to go through the code and get rid of all of these things one after the other, after the other, after the other. Um, and so maybe that's why we do have to think about looking at things like uh, permitting mistake of law defenses. Uh, Josh, why don't you ask your question? Um, I, I have uh, one question, but as I listened to the last conversation, I now have two, so I'll try to keep them very brief. Uh, the, the, the first one, the one that just occurred to me is that um, I think there are these sort of interpretive default rules, like the word unlawful means the word criminal, means subject to uh, federal prosecutor's jurisdiction in a sense. And I wonder if we could kind of elegantly and substantially reduce the number of federal crimes, especially by just changing some of our interpretive default rules. It's never been obvious to me why unlawful means uh, criminal. Um, of course, if, if there could be penalties prescribed in a statutory text, in a statutory provision, and we could interpret them as long as they're non-carceral as civil penalties. So I, I wonder if there's actually, a, you could imagine a statute that simply says the word unlawful coupled with financial penalties shall not be assumed to be a criminal offense absent a further clear statement by the by Congress, right? So like a, like a, like a clear statement rule. What I'm wondering about is sort of the doctrinal potential of certain interpretive interventions. I, I'd be curious, especially what different and, and and Shana, Shana, am I saying this right? Shana it's okay. uh, uh, would think about that. Here's the question I was originally going to uh, ask, or, or almost proposal, and, and as much as anyone, it's for Michael, Michael Sirota. Uh, uh, there have been some really interesting discussions and disagreements about what to expect from jurors charged with different forms of mens rea language. Uh, it showed up in my sort of uh, celebration of Vera's paper, Ken's uh, pushback in his paper, and Ken and I had a sort of uh, sidebar about these matters. It just showed up in Alex's question. I wonder if the next step where for, for theorists and, and, and um, uh, policy activists, uh, both interested in criminal justice reform, 
is to get better information empirically from well-designed studies of how jurors would respond to different kinds of mens rea terms and different model jury instructions. It seems to me that the uh, empirical studies aren't that tough. You would have to, you know, pull out of sample jury instructions or from theoretical work, some, some model jury instructions, and then you need to give um, your, your, the group you're sampling uh, uh, relative facts. And, and now, the hardest thing would probably be coming up with the standards. I mean, is a more lenient jury, is my standard of intra-observer agreement the relevant standard of clarity? Uh, is is a, a more lenient jury response necessarily a better one? It might not be, right? It might be that there are cases where what we want is unified conviction or something like that. But I, I think it would be possible to design uh, a study and it would be the next step for a group like this one. Two thoughts. Uh, I'm not sure, it, well, who would like to respond to that? We have just a couple minutes left here, like a minute and a half. Hey, I love empirical studies. I think that that would be helpful. I, I, do, I do think that maybe um, that would help inform the next step for criminal law reformers, which is definitely to, the, to, to finally, particularly on the federal level, say what, which mens rea terms are we going to use? Which ones are the best ones? Which sort of balance sort of public safety or whatever it is that we're trying to regulate or control versus sort of fairness? And then, and then, and what do those mean? Because of course, there are 20 different types of mens rea words used in the federal code, and importantly, almost none of them are defined, uh, either inside the code themselves or even by Supreme Court law. And so they just mean some wildly different things across the country, which is fundamentally unfair. So, so studies that would help us get closer to that, yes. You know, at first my gut was, well, of course, you know, jury instructions are but rarely used because we the reality is we live in a coerced plea bargained environment where less than two percent of federal defendants actually ever exercise their constitutional right to a trial but perhaps actually having things like things fixed in the law like what what do, what does it mean to commit a crime what does a men, what mens rea is required and what on earth does that mean and would provide us all with the ability to um uh, decide what, what, that we need to take more cases to trial and actually defend them, uh, because certainly the the not knowing those things is what leads a lot of criminal defense lawyers to say to a client, I'm telling you, I, you, I don't know what the word knowingly in the statute means, and neither does the jury. There's going to be a lot of confusion, and the prosecutor is going to say X, we're going to say Y, you want to take your chance, or do you want to take the plea deal for six months right now? And almost, and clearly, uh, an overwhelming number of people is, are choosing a certainty rather than take their, well, roll the dice, so to speak. And then because certainly there's a trial penalty that is involved, the six month, you know, the prosecutor saying, and if you fight me at the end of the day, you'll get a 10 year sentence and not a six month sentence. So um, anything that you can do to bring more clarity to allow a change in that kind of system, I think uh, would ultimately be doing the most good. Um, so I, apologies to the one or two people perhaps who wanted still to ask questions. I understand we are now out of time. Um, thank you very much to all your, to all the panelists. Uh, this was really very fascinating and very lively discussion. I enjoyed it. Um, and I am also under instructions to pass the mic back to our fearless leader, Michael Sirota, to end the, uh, to end the conference, I believe. Thank you, Gideon, and thank you to everyone. Um, so first, I just want to say thank you to everyone at home who watched this event. Um, you know, I I hope you got something out of it. Uh, it's been it's I think it's been a, you know a fascinating two days worth of panels and discussions. Um, but you know, the the Academy for Justice uh, you know appreciates the attention. There, everyone's working hard to try and make interesting criminal justice ideas accessible to the public and criminal justice reformers and. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're really grateful for you spending your time with us. Um, I also want to just thank sincerely, again, the panelists and participants. Um, it just, yeah, it's been so amazing and wonderful to see everyone gathered here. And, you know, uh, I know there, these are difficult times and everyone has a lot of things going on. So the fact that everyone made time to come and 
you know, spent, spent time these two days is just, it's, it's really appreciated. Um, when we went into this, the question, you know, at the heart was, does mens rea have a role to play in criminal justice reform? Um, you know, I'm not, it's not clear to me that we decisively resolve that, but, I, you know, I think we heard many arguments and, and reasons to believe that, that, it, that it does. Um, I do think two thi- maybe two things came pretty clearly out of, out of the past two days. I think, one, the value of having these conversations and, you know, having a broad cross-section of academics, criminal justice reformers, practitioners getting together and have that discussion. I think, um, you know, at least f- from my own perspective, these two days of, of, of panels really illustrated the value in that. Um, and the second is just that, you know, criminal law is the best field <laughs> that there is. It's just, you know, it's inherently interesting and, and just so many fascinating topics. And, you know, it's just, so it's, it's, it's great to, to get to spend two full days talking criminal law. Um, finally, before we wrap up, I just have to thank the amazing Academy for Justice staff who made this all possible. Don Walton, Jennifer Jost, and, uh, and Suzanne Stewart. You know, th- these two days could not have happened without you. And we're just, we're all so, so very grateful that you, you guys were able to, to, to make this happen. Um, so thank you for that. And so with that, uh, I'm going to say goodbye. I hope everyone takes care, take care of one another. And uh, yeah, hope to see everyone again soon sometime.